Hi, I'm Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm the host of the Creative Solutions podcast and the author of Die by the Sword and the Fairy Godmother Diaries. You can find me at, at Isolde T on pretty much everything. You can go to Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, and find me at Isolde T. You can find my website is isoldatauthor.com or isoldaspeaks.com. And right now you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a multi-talented individual. She is, of course, a podcast host, author, playwright, editor, has an amazing etymology to her name and <laughs> reference by... Marina Friedman Watts, who is a very talented individual in her own right. She is. She's recommended a ton of people to the show, and I can't thank her enough. Isolde Trachtenberg, how are you doing today? Hey, Kurt, I'm great. Thank you for having me. And you have the smoothest voice that I've ever heard on this show so far this year. Oh, that's lovely. I appreciate that. Maybe next time we'll talk about what I did to make my voice like this. It's not just the microphone. <laughs> Rena, of course, recommends you based on your podcast. We had a wonderful conversation because eventually I'll be on your own show. Yay. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Oh, load of questions. So who <laughs> I am, I'm Isolde Trachtenberg, and thank you so much for your kind introduction. Kurt, one of the things that I do is I host the Creative Solutions podcast, and that is a show where I interview creative artists and performers, business leaders, entrepreneurs, all of whom are innovating to change the world, to make the world a better place somehow. So I've been lucky enough to have some Grammy Award winners and Tony Award winners, but also best-selling authors and people at the highest echelons of business. So people who are all interested in making the world a better place. And the show just got picked up for the next edition of Podcasting for Dummies, which is really cool and exciting, which means it's a, one of the featured shows. And I'm also an author. I've written nine books and am part of a bunch of anthologies. Just got picked up for another anthology, which I'm very excited about, which is The Sisters in Crime, the next upcoming anthology. That just got had. I just signed the contract, so that just happened. And I have three fiction books out. One series is about a fairy godmother who is badass, whiskey swilling, <laughs> wears combat boots, and she lives in New York City, and her job, her career, is to help the musicians of New York find their way. And the other one is about a professional tarot card reader named Cassie Belmont. It's the Cassie Belmont Tarot Mysteries, and that's Die by the Sword. She's a professional tarot card reader who works with the police to solve crimes, and someday, someday I will see that as a TV show a la Buffy or Nancy Drew. I'm working on that. That's a big hope of mine. Well, I definitely want to be on set when that first episode and pilot gets started. That should be an amazing experience. Sure. I would love it. I would love it. Yeah. The journey as a podcaster is long, tedious, and lonely sometimes, but yeah. we do this because we like to talk to creative and talented people. Talk to us about your podcast journey and how you got started. I'm embracing the pause for a second. So I was a DJ at my high school radio station and then was a professional DJ for a while after that. Then I realized over time, after I overcame my public speaking phobia in school, because I used to have one, I used to be terrified to speak in public, not that you can tell now. And I realized that as a writer, I speak better than I write. So for example, my books, I tend to record voice to text and then that's how I write my books. And the podcasting thing started because I love I love radio and I love talking with people and I love teaching people how to communicate, how to use their voices. So, for example, when I was talking about what I did to my voice to make it sound the way it sounds, that's mostly me. Like the microphone is giving you a true representation of what I sound like, which is cool, but you work on it. There are techniques. And so I wanted to talk to people about that part of it, sort of get the word out about how you can use your voice to speak up, to speak out, to feel confident. And then I wanted to have a contribution in making the world a better place. And I was talking to interviewing Captain Paul Watson, who is uh, was with the Sea Shepherd Conservation Corps and also one of the founders of Greenpeace. And I said, you know, I want to be one of those people who's on the ships, but I just don't, that's not, 
I can't do it. I have bad knees. I can't be on a ship for months at a time helping pr protect the whales. And he said to me, you know, you're doing something. You, I do what I can do, which is be on a ship. And you're doing what you can do, which is shining the light on people who are creating and innovating to change the world. And so when I, when I heard him say that, I went, yes, yes, that's it. That's my truth. And so that's really the the seed of what I wanted to do. I wanted to talk to people who are being creative, who are being innovative. And I've met some amazing people, people who write mystery novels and people who go out and save whales doing direct action and people who are at the top of the business game and Grammy award winning musicians and artists. And so all of that gives me the opportunity to highlight their work but also to have these incredible conversations that allow us all to sort of see that we can do it too. You know, if you want to do a podcast, if you want to start a book, if you want to start taking dance lessons, whatever it is you want to do, you can. And that's what I wanted to highlight. And the podcast really gives me the opportunity to do that. And what's interesting is it's gone through some iterations. For example, it started out with as the creative mindset or actually it started out as tell your stories better because I was focusing only on writing and telling stories because I'm a natural storyteller. And then it moved to the creative mindset and sort of thinking about things creatively. And then it moved to the innovative mindset because more of my guests were coming from the business field. And then I went, you know what? No, I really want to be talking about creative solutions. So I changed it, not this past January, but January of 2023, I rebranded as the Creative Solutions Podcast and went, yeah, this feels right. And when the authors of Podcasting for Dummies, the next edition, contacted me as the innovative mindset, the show was in the last edition of Podcasting for Dummies. And they went, oh, it seems like you've pod faded. We can't find your show anymore. <laughs> Is it like, what can we do? And I said, actually, no, I just rebranded, renamed, and it's still here. And they're like, great, we're putting you in the book, which is, again, really flattering and wonderful. But because I changed the name and changed the focus a little, they couldn't find me. So mm. it's one of those things, as you're changing information, it's really important to remember to sort of tweak and tell people that <laughs> I, I guess I was not as forthcoming with the change as I could have been. And that's changed how everything goes for me, you know, I'm focusing differently, but I also need to be communicating that. And that was a real lesson for me. And it keeps being a lesson as I delve deeper into communication, creativity, and innovative collaborations on the show and also in my career and life. That's what I find interesting is we feel like sometimes we're shouting into the void of the internet when we are mm -hmm. one person out of 8 billion in the world. And we're trying to get the message across. And maybe it's our own message. Maybe it's our guest's message. It comes back to, do we feel like our message is getting heard? I think that's one of the hardest mm -hmm. questions to ask ourselves. But based on what you're describing, it sounds like your message is loud and clear out there, which is great to hear. I appreciate you saying that. And the thing is, there's so many people who are selling courses and webinars and videos and da 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 da, da about engagement. Mm -hmm. That's the way to do it. And this is what you should do. And what I'm realizing is on some levels, they're right, you know, being real, being who you are, but also really caring about the people who are giving you their attention. That's a big deal. If somebody is willing to take time out of their commute or out of their day, to listen to something I have to say, I'm so pathetically grateful. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe you live. This is amazing because you don't have to, you know, you absolutely do not have to listen to anything anybody says or does. The fact that you choose to listen to my show or, or this show, you know, Two Geeks Talking, that's a big deal. And so the engagement part of it is caring about the people. And, and it's funny, when I talk to my guests before they come on the show, I always say, I want you to focus on giving 60% of everything that you say about my audience to my audience. 30% can be for you and 10% can be for me. And everybody's like, uh, okay, that's a good ratio. I got it. And the reason it's mostly for my audience is because without our audiences, we are talking into the void. So it's important to really bear that in mind and appreciate it. Between podcasting and being an author and, and being a, a wonderful person that you are here, uh -huh. how do you think we can foster a culture that celebrates individuality and encourages self-discovery rather than conformity? Ooh. <laughs> oh, you ask such small questions, Kurt. Uh, yeah, you know, it's really, that's an interesting question because 
Rugged individualism is something, especially in this country, that's been praised. But at the same time, there's a lot of pressure to conform. So we are constantly sitting at the at the fulcrum of this weird dichotomy. And I think to me, one of the most important things that we can do is develop our critical thinking skills because conformity can be good. If everybody's running out of the burning building, my goodness, run out of the burning building. That's a beautiful thing to do. But at the same time, we have to look at it from a slightly different perspective, which is if everybody's jumping off the bridge, is there a reason to jump off the bridge? Why is everyone jumping off the bridge? Let me look and see and assess and evaluate. Now, if it's an emergency and there's a speeding rhinoceros coming at you, okay, you jump off the bridge and you take your chances that there are no hippopotami in the water below mm -hmm. you. But I think that some of this has to be our own ability to assess and evaluate what's in front of us instead of just accepting what someone else says. So critical thinking is one of the most important things. And for me, meditation is one of the most important things. The two in many ways go hand in hand because in order to be able to think well and think critically, I rely on my meditation practice to bring me the sort of open-mindedness and the clarity of mind to be able to see things and respond to them instead of reacting to them. And the way I describe it to the, to the coaching clients I work with is the difference between reaction and response is the number of breaths you take between what happens and what you do about it. To me, the reaction is that knee jerk, fight or flight or freeze, let's go, the sympathetic nervous system. But if you take a couple breaths between, you know, again, emergencies aside, and you allow your body to respond, mm -hmm. then you can do it with that critical thinking facet of the whole thing. And that makes everything go a lot more smoothly. And we can be individuals while at the same time assessing what the rest of the group is doing and deciding consciously whether or not it's something we want to join or whether or not we need to be out on our own because it is ultimately what's best either for us or for the whole group objectively. You've had many, many different careers. It's hard to gauge what exactly <laughs> we can dive into between a wonderful martial arts background, to being an author, to being a, a podcast host. I had a hard time researching for this particular interview only because you're one of my more varied guests when it comes to different careers. And it's mm. it's hard as a, as a host to pinpoint True. what exactly we, we would love to talk about here. So <laughs> <laughs> let's dive into the author side of you here, because Great. you did mention that you enjoy speaking with words. You enjoy speaking and communicating mm -hmm. in general. But looking at yourself as an author, how did you know you could do this professionally? And when did that light bulb appear for you? I'll let you know when that light bulb appears, actually. Uh, okay. It's funny how many authors I talk to, people I know in the industry and people I interview for the show who go, yeah, I still sometimes look at myself and go, I'm a writer? What? <laughs> the first fiction, nonfiction book I wrote was, it's called Life Elements. It's about how to become a more well-rounded person using ancient alchemical elements of earth, air, fire, and water. And what I was doing was I was coaching. I was doing a lot of uh, life and career coaching back in the early aughts. And a lot of my clients would go, you're telling me this stuff. I'd really love to have it all in one place so that I know what to refer to. You should write a book. And I went, uh, okay, maybe I should write a book. And so so I started writing this book. It took me four years to write because it's a whole system. It's a It's a big deal, which is great as far as my clients are concerned, because people who want to read it get to read it and we move on and they can apply the the lessons in it uh, for the, you know, you can do that for the rest of your life, which is great. So I wrote the book to help my clients and went, huh, that's so interesting. I wrote a book and my friend uh, Petra Mayer, rest in peace, who was uh, beloved and was a, a NPR books editor, uh, said to me, you know, Zolda, you're kind of weird. And I said, why? And she said, because you decided to write a book and then you did. And I went, yeah, I guess I did. Huh. And so that sort of made me go, I wanted to write a book. And then I wrote a book and it was the dedication of put your butt in your seat and write for 2000 words a day to write the book, to actually do the physical facet of write the book, or I wrote a lot of life elements while walking my dog in the woods. As I said, most of my writing is done voice to text, but this was before voice to text because I wrote it from 2004 to 2008. So that was typing. 
When the first fiction book, when I got the idea for it, that was also, this was during the days of Live Journal. This will tell you how long ago <laughs> that was. Even though I believe it still exists, I have not been on it for well over a decade. But I had written Life Elements and I was going, should I use a nom de plume? Should I use some sort of a pseudonym to publish this book? Because I was also at that time working at NASA and being a professional musician at the same time. And I didn't know if this more kind of new agey woo woo book would be okay with the people I was working at NASA with. So I went uh, at one point on live journal, I said, Oh, you know, I could name myself evening star song bottom. And that would be the name of the author of the book. And I just threw out evening star song bottom because that's what came out of my mouth or out of my fingers at the moment. And then I went, huh, evening star song bottom. Who is that? And that started me down the path of going, she's a fairy godmother who's a musician and she works with musicians in New York City and boom. And that started me on the path to writing the fairy godmother diaries. I've written two books. I have three, four and five in my head. I just have to find time to write them. But everything has sort of gone through this process of the grain of the next thing is in the old thing. And so the same thing goes with the Cassie Belmont Terror Reader Mysteries. This is the, the new series. I'm an immigrant and I was born in the former Soviet Union. And my great grandmother taught me how to read playing cards. Mm -hmm. There was no tarot cards. And then when we left the Soviet Union, we immigrated here over a year, spent time living in Israel in a war zone. And then when I was 15 or 16, I was at a Borders Books and I saw tarot cards for the first time. And I went, huh, what are these? And I started reading about meanings and all of that. And I went, you know, this sounds really familiar. And I went, what? This is what Grandma Golda taught me. And she taught me on regular playing cards, but they are related, right? There are suits in the tarot cards that actually correspond to the four suits of the play, regular playing deck, blah, blah, blah. I started reading and I started reading for friends and I started reading professionally and I've read at the White House, not for making actual decisions, but for the, in the Obama White House, I did a party there. Yeah. So I've, I've had a really fun career doing that. It's another one of the things I've done. Now I do coaching intuitively with it. But the point is that I went, okay. And I love mystery stories. Agatha Christie is one of my favorites, blah, blah, blah. So I started thinking about what if a tarot card reader was a professional living in D.C., which is where I was living at the time. And what if she helped the police to solve crimes? What would a story like that look like? And this was during the pandemic. Of course, we'd already moved here. And here's what's interesting. I, I went, I want to be able to have a deck that's just Cassie's, my main character in the book. Great. So during the pandemic, when everything was shut down, I designed and created a tarot deck. It's called the Functional Tarot, and it's out there, and it's literally on the cover of the book. My my book designer incorporated the tarot cards I created into the cover of Die by the Sword. And if I had my green screen set up, which I don't, you would be able to see the different tarot. The point is that all of that, like the tarot card deck itself got developed. I developed that because I wanted Cassie to have her own deck that no one else in the world has. Now, I sell the deck. Other people can use it, of course. But in the world of the deck, Cassie uses this deck that was created just for her. All of this is sort of flowing one into the other. And each one of these books, interestingly, is is still following life elements because the first one is Die by the Sword, which is the air element. The next one is going to be called the Poisoned Cup, which is the water element. The, the one after that is going to be called Spared the Rod, which is the fire element, and then Coin of the Realm is the earth element. So there are going to be four books in the series, and it harkens back way to my first book. So the threads of all of this have been running through my writing and my thinking for decades. <laughs> Long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, no, no but, but, but this is what makes you a good storyteller as well, because I was entranced the entire way as you were talking about it. This is just incredible. So much to unpack, you know, just casually mentioned NASA, the White House, Obama, you know, it is what it is. You know, it just seems like <laughs> a, a typical Tuesday for his old year. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Okay. So this is two geeks talking, and I guess I need to ask you how serious I'm allowed to be. As serious as you'd like. Okay. So I am a child abuse survivor, and my father uh, was 
uh, to say dictatorial, yes. Physically abusive, yes. Uh, and he would do things like he would hold a white piece of paper in front of you and he would say, I am your father. And if I say this piece of paper is black, your job is to say, yes, dad, it's black. And it was that kind of household growing up and uh, especially, you know, Soviet Union, all of that. Uh, there's a lot of alcoholism. There's a lot of um, a lot of abuse, uh, at least people I know. Anyway, so when I found out words have power, my father and my older sister particularly were uh, their relationship was terrible. And he was particularly he was particularly abusive to her. And uh, there was one point I was eight years old, maybe nine. And he, he, he was, uh, he had hit my sister. He was hitting all of us. He was in a rage. Uh, not that I excuse any behavior like that. This was, you know, obviously criminal and abusive. The cops were at our house a lot. And, uh, and truthfully, I don't remember this. My mother tells me this story about me. He was at the top of the stairs and I stood at the bottom of the stairs. And I started talk. I had I had read my first Nancy Drew book and was enamored of Carson Drew, who, who was Nancy's father, who was this kind, supportive dad, which, pff, you know, also Howard Cunningham was one of my uh, models for uh, kinds and supportive people. Anyway, from happy days. Anyway, so I stood at the bottom of the stairs and I started talking relatively quietly from what I understand about what a father is, about what a good father is, about the father's role being about providing for his children and caring about his children and protecting his children. And that this is what he should be trying to do instead of what he was doing. And my mom said that what he did was he stopped he was he at that point had been trying to break into my sister's bedroom to to hit her more he stopped at the top of the stairs he turned he listened to what i had to say and then he just walked into his bedroom and closed the door and that was it and i stopped him with my words with what i was saying from trying to hit her more so that was probably, uh, I've, I had lots of other ones, but that's probably one of the first times that I realized that, wow, do words have power, particularly when they are words that are not said in anger. In other words, I wasn't screaming. Screaming only gets people defensive. I didn't scream. I was actually quite calm in my description. Now, uh, when I talk about, you know, my grand, I never knew either grandfather because they both died in World War II. And my, my parents both had horrific lives. Soviet Union post-World War II is absolutely horrific. And uh, as children, they had awful lives. But again, I feel like everybody makes, I think at one point or another, you stand at the crossroads and you decide the kind of person you're going to be. And uh, you can decide if you were abused to be an abuser yourself and continue that pattern, or you can take a stand and say, no, that's not who I'm going to be. And uh, he didn't choose the not, you know, he didn't choose the latter. So uh, so at that point, you know, my heart weeps for him as a child, but I hold him accountable as an adult. So words having power, I think, is so important for us to understand that you can make you can stop a train, you know, metaphorically with your words. And so that showed me, and this is before I developed my public speaking phobia. So I, I had the kernel of knowing that words have power and then I developed public speaking phobia. And then when I came out of it, I came back to that notion that, yeah, we can make incredible changes with just our words. It's also an amazing transition to into yourself as an author as well. The fact that you've gone through all of this and that it, uh, the positivity of, of what you're putting together as an author and as a speaker and as a communicator is, is something that I think a lot of people should aspire to as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, the question is what question do I use to follow up from that? That's uh, <laughs> that's enough, another tough one there. You know, I can tell you about my star Wars shirt 
my yeah, husband I, went went to a thing and brought me Star Wars shirt, and I am a ginormous Star Wars nerd. Not as big as I used to be, admittedly, but I love me some original, the nice. OG yeah, Star sure. Wars. So I I want to I want to honestly be more in. We don't have Disney Plus, so I don't. I don't. I have. I watched like the first season of Mandalorian, but I haven't seen anything since then. Same. And and I and I want to. I just. But also, like, there's. I keep. I keep seeing something in front of my eyes that says, you know, watching television is watching other people live their lives instead mm. of you living your life. And I kind of. Uh, <laughs> but I love television. It's how I learned to speak English. It's so much. It's been so important to me. But at the same time, I have books to write mm. and plays to write and you know, yeah, yeah. workshops to prepare for whatever it is. So I, I kind of end up in this space of going, do I watch television or do I work on my play or do I work on my book or do I go and I live in New York city and, and go into some amazing, like I'm going tonight to a, to a, to the premiere of Christ Spiracy, okay. which is a, a documentary all about religion and food essentially. Somebody said, I have a free ticket. Yes, thank you. I'll take it. There's never a dull moment. And at that point, you have to go, okay, I want to watch TV, but I also want to be out in the world or or be creating something that could potentially be on TV, like Die by the Sword, the tarot card books, right? Lots of possibilities. Then what has changed then from watching, say, Buffy and, and Angel and those shows of the 90s to to today? Is it just life? Is it just your expectations for yourself? TV went digital. That's part of it. Everything is pay for this or mm. pay for that. Mm. And we didn't up when TV went digital, we didn't upgrade. So uh, that's part of it. But part of it also is, you know, I wrote my first book and started writing it in 2004. And that was right around when Angel ended. And I loved shows like Jericho. Jericho season one is one of my top favorite of all TV shows. And then the reality TV revolution happened. Oh, and I, I am not a fan of reality TV. Yeah. So uh, none of no, I've never watched any of those shows, but they were so prevalent for, mm -hmm. for a while there that I kind of got turned off to yeah. TV because there was so much of real housewives of Salt Lake cities, <laughs> you know, what, come on, seriously. So, so that's part of it is that what was on was not great, but then there are shows that I, that I love that I, I, and I haven't, you know, Homeland, I love Damian Lewis very much. So Homeland and Billions, great shows, but I also stopped watching them. At some point, I just didn't have time. Mm. So, uh, and and today, I, I what what would be a modern show that I have watched? Oh, Hacks! I love Hacks. I tried my hand at stand up comedy after Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I also love. Uh, that's probably one of my top five shows of all time. And and you will notice, Kurt, by the way, that I have like forty two top five shows. <laughs> so, when the show is good, when it's great. Like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, I, by hook or by crook, I will make time. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be great. If it's not great, and I'm the same way. I don't know if you've noticed this with books. I have gotten to the point where if the book doesn't grab me within the mm -hmm. first chapter or two, okay. I put it down. And maybe that's not giving the book a chance, but I feel like if you're writing, you need to you need to have something strong enough to hook me or I'm not going to be able to do it. And it's interesting as a podcast host because I get sent galleys you know, I'm going to have this best-selling author on my show and she is terrific and I love her as a person, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and the problem is that if I read the book or try to read the book and the book isn't grabbing me, that's tough yeah. because then you're sitting there going, how do I do this? You know, I've just gotten sent to galley for a book that's coming out in, I guess, August and it's a science fiction story and I should love it. And I'm trying to read it and I'm going, this is not, this is not great. Yeah. And as a, as a host, I'm sure you see this too. How do I do this? And you have to figure out, you know, if I've already said you can be on my show, I have to figure out what we're going to talk about. And so rather than talk about the book itself, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about the writer's process and the writer's comps and the writer's inspiration, because I'm not going to lie. You know, if I'm doing a review or something, I don't lie, but I also need to focus on what works for me and what doesn't work for me. And if the book isn't working for me, 
they're not coming on my show to talk about what's not working for me, <laughs> so, you know? So it's also, you know, serving my audience, but it's also serving my guests. I want to be sure that I'm cognizant of, of the fact that they are trying to promote this creative thing that they've done. And if it's not to my taste, if it's not working for me, that doesn't mean it won't work for potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of people out there. So it's this interesting thing. And the same with TV shows, recommending or not recommending a show because I do that. I I do reviews on, on my show sometimes. I will recommend Jericho till the cows come home. I will recommend Mrs. Maisel the same way. Hacks, I will recommend. But there are shows that I've that I've had people go, can you, rec can you do a review of this show? And I'll watch the first couple of episodes and I'm like, mm. and I want to be able to let it find its footing. I do, but I don't have the time. I will then turn around and go, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I can't review this because I don't want to give it a bad review. I just don't want to... I'm not going to lie. And so if I do the review, it's going to be honest. And that's a problem. Does that make sense? No, totally. Yeah. It's, but it's also like when you get a guest that comes on the show and you may be prepared, but they're not as forthcoming information wise. They're mm. like pulling teeth when it comes to trying to get answers on, on them. Mm. And that's, that's happened a handful of times uh, for me, but you know, you try to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're nervous, maybe whatever, but that's what the green room's for as well, just to kind of get that conversation flowing to get a feel for them. Sure. And then, you know, you find out whether or not you have chemistry when you're talking like you and I met just a few days ago mm -hmm. and I was, I, I was certain, I was like, we're going to have the best conversation <laughs> when, when you're on my show, I'm on your show. I think it's going to be at least fun for us, hopefully entertaining <laughs> for anybody listening, but at least fun for us. I'll do my best. <laughs> Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your various careers? Wow. Because the wisest comes up real quick. The second <laughs> wisest. I guess the second wisest would be figure out how to be confident. Hmm. How do you do that? I meditate. I keep trying. I keep showing up. I failed more times than you can possibly shake a stick at. And uh, it's funny, Rich, my husband was just talking to his mom recently and she's very sweet. She likes my writing and, uh, and she, every book that comes out, she, she wants a copy, which is great. And I don't even know if she's reading with this point. She's in her nineties. I'm not sure. Maybe. And maybe she's just like, I, I, you know, she says to me, I, I point at, at their, uh, independent living facility. I pointed it. That's my daughter-in-law's book. She wrote that. It's very sweet. But she said to him recently, and I was, I was there listening to the conversation. They were on speakerphone and she said, you know, Isolde's done a lot of different things. And Rich is like, yes, she has. And she goes, well, she can't possibly be successful at all of them. And Rich goes, well, pretty successful. But then also she just doesn't stop trying. And his mom went, yeah, she really doesn't stop trying. And so, <laughs> and I listened to that and I went, yeah, that's true. I really, you know, if this didn't work, I'm going to go try something else. If that didn't work, I'm going to go try this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. So, so some of it is what's the worst that can happen. You can muck up like crazy. Okay. You mucked up. I have mucked up more than you can again, shake a stick at, I've failed tons of times, but so what? This is our one go around, you know, this is it. So why not try everything that you can think of, everything that you want? And if I show up and I'm scared, then I'm not going to have as much uh, opportunity to thrive. And I don't mean don't be scared. I mean, if you're scared, be scared. But remember that you have what it takes, you just do. By the very nature of the fact that you are here, that you are on this planet hurtling through space, and I worked at NASA so I know how fast, uh, like going around, you know, rotating, going around the sun, in the, gal in the solar system, in the galaxy, la la la, all of that stuff. We're moving really fast, and yet we are held to this planet and we have four, roughly four miles of atmosphere to breathe. We have a tiny bit of the planet ready for water uh, that we can use. To, and the sun is shining just so that we can grow plants. There's just so much that's all working in concert for us to be here now. 
that that wonderful, amazing thing is not something we can waste. So to me, spending time being scared feels like a waste. So I'm just going to be confident. I'm going to try it. And if I mess up, that is okay because I'll try the next thing tomorrow. These introspective questions are for a documentary called Little Person Amongst Media Giants. They were four questions I was going to ask Stanley. Uh, that never happened. So I ask creative and talented people like yourself the same four questions I was going to ask him. And there are no wrong answers. And if you go to a psychologist afterwards, I'm not paying the bill. <laughs> That's I like the disclaimer. <laughs> Everyone usually has one person that inspires them down, down their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Just one? Yikes. I've had I've had so many inspirations. I will say Mary Alice Powell. We called her MAP. She was the choir director in my high school for my first few years of going there. She left before I was a senior or even before I was a junior. She brought a love of music and a love of bringing people together in song to everything she did. She had been a nurse and a nun in the Korean War, and she left the nunhood and ended up teaching choir in Oak Park, Michigan. She fostered talents like Jeffrey Seller, who's executive producer of little shows like Hamilton and Rent and Avenue Q and In the Heights, and Andrew Lippo, who wrote the music and lyrics to The Adams Family. She helped me learn how to teach and I love teaching because I love seeing that light of, oh, I get it in people's eyes. And so did she. So she inspired in me not only a love of singing and helped me discover my love of singing in harmony, but she inspired in me a love of teaching others so that they can discover the wonder of using their voices themselves, but using their voices themselves with others. From a professional standpoint, you are successful in many different industries and avenues from podcast to author to many things that we didn't touch on, but we will definitely have to have you back on to just glance at the life that is, of course, is older, uh, because this is just too short of a time to even dive into everything you've done. So professionally, you're successful in many different regards. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yes and no. The no is because there's always some cool new thing that I want to try. Uh, right now, for example, I am teaching myself piano. I play guitar, I play violin, I sing, and I've always wanted to learn how to play piano. And when I was a child, my father wanted to hear piano violin duets. My older sister played piano, I played violin, no choice. And I still like the violin, but I don't love the violin. I love the piano. And I set myself these goals. In 2010 to 2011, I wrote a short story every single day for a year to improve my writing. During the pandemic, I created a digital art piece every single day for a year to improve that part of my life. This year, I am practicing piano for at least 25 minutes a day, every single day, no matter what. That's what my challenge is. I wanted to uh, study martial arts. I did when I was a teenager. I went back. I'm also a Tai Chi practitioner, but I went back. I started studying Aikido. I got my first dawn. Why? Because I was curious about it. So pro professionally successful, whatever that is. So on some levels, I think personally successful, yes, because I feel like I'm getting to live the life I want to live uh, while at the same time trying to minimize any bad impact on other people, right? I'm vegan, for example, so I don't eat animals and I don't use animal products. And I worked at NASA, so I'm a conservationist and environmentalist. So I try to minimize my, my negative impact on the world around me and try to elevate my positive impact. For example, when I'm out anytime, every single day, if I am out of my apartment, I find oh, usually a woman, a random woman, and I compliment her and I will say something nice about her. Oh, I love your shirt. Oh, I you're beautiful. I, you are so gorgeous. And let me tell you something. I just, I don't know them. And I don't, it's not creepy in that I don't stick around and wait for them to, I just, to, you know, I just want to let you know you are glowing or you are beautiful. And then I move on. And what always, to a one, 
follows me is, oh my God, thank you. And one time I was walking, I was about to leave a Chipotle, walking out of the Chipotle and there's a woman who is sitting there. She was probably in her late sixties, very, you know, sort of put well put together and about to eat her dinner or whatever. And she was stunning. And I just walked over her and said, ma'am, sorry to interrupt your dinner. I just wanted to let you know, you are stunning. And she started crying and she just tears sprang in her eyes. And she said, you have no idea what hearing that just now means to me. And I, and, and I didn't stay to find, like, I don't want to interrupt anybody's life. I just wanted to say what I wanted. But she said, you know, thank you. That really, Another time I'm in Costco and I stopped a woman and I said, I just want to let you know, like, I, I can tell that you've got a lot going on, but your eyes are fierce. You are just supercharged. And she stopped. She sort of oh, stepped back and she went, wow. And I said, what? And she said, I'm exhausted. I am exhausted. But it's really nice to know that I've still got it. And we both went our separate ways, right? That The point of this exercise, and I've been doing it for over 20 years, is to elevate the good in the world. And telling someone something lovely or nice about them does that and it works because I have no other agenda, right? I don't I don't have any expectation of anything. I just do it. So on that level, if I'm helping anybody, that also makes me personally successful because I want to help. I want to be there. I want to enjoy life. I want to create stuff. I want to pet my cats. I want to experience amazing art and life in New York City, like they're doing um, the Ghostbusters movies about to come out. Well, it will have come out by the time this episode airs. And they're doing an activation at Fire Engine 8, where the OG, where the where the guys were in the original Ghostbusters, and they had, they're doing this beautiful activation. And I went, I'm going to go see that. And sure enough, I went and I saw it and I was there and it's called something like the Frozen Empire or yeah. something. I don't know. Anyway, and I, and I got you know, pictures and video, I talked to some of the firefighters, some of the police officers, and they were little kids. They were like, this is so exciting for us. And I'm like, yes, this is amazing. So that's another thing. I get to do with my life what I choose to do. And if I want to go see Ghostbusters or Christ Spiracy or uh, walk the High Line after midnight, although they don't like it, they, it's closed, or, 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 or travel or play the piano or whatever, what I want to do, what I choose to do, I get to do as long as I, you know, feed my cats and pay my rent and all that. That is a successful life to me. Do as little harm as possible, be of help and get to create on your own terms. Boom. <laughs> That's successful. Nice. Love that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? What I usually say to myself when I when I fail is, well, learn that lesson. <laughs> and I evaluate what went wrong and what I want to do differently next time. Yeah. So let me, I'll give you, <laughs> I hope you don't mind all the stories. So, so this is, this is going to be interesting. Uh, during the pandemic, I went, I need a writing community. I'm going to start one. And so I started the Vegan Writers of NYC, the Vegan Writers of New York City. We have a bunch of members. We, you know, meetings, people get together, da, 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 da. Right now it's kind of at a lull, not doing it. I don't have time <laughs> and nobody else has picked up the slack. But as part of doing this, I, uh, I run the meetings and we write a story based on three prompt words, three random prompt words, an, okay, an object, a location, or a profession. You write a story. You have 10 minutes to write the story. And out of those stories, we decided to create an anthology. So I, uh, under my publication banner, Creative Earthlings, I put out in a New York Minute this, this writer's anthology from the Vegan Writers of NYC. About a year ago, we had a book release party for this, which also doubled as a fundraiser for two animal rights charities, Wild Tomorrow, which is an amazing charity. They're, they're helping wildlife in Africa, South Africa specifically, and Red Robin Song Animal Sanctuary that takes in animals that were farmed, but now is a rescue for them. Dual fundraiser. That was my goal for this whole thing. One of the people who who wanted to be in the anthology missed the deadline by months to be in the print book, but I decided because I'm sometimes too nice, I'd put him into the digital. And when it came time to 
do the event, he wanted to read. Everyone's going to be reading a part of uh, one of their short stories out of the anthology. He wanted to read. And I said, no, you can't because this is for the print version only because it's a fundraiser and we're selling the print version and all the money we make off the print version goes to these two charities. And in the middle of the event, he made the decision as I was saying goodbye and thank you and doing the last push for the books, buy the books so that we can fund, you know, give more money to these charities. He went, no, you forgot something. You forgot me. And he sort of bullied his way up onto the stage, got the mic and read his story that wasn't even in the book. And that was a failure on my part. I, in that moment, had to sort of go, what am I going to do? And I made the decision, I'm not going to sort of get into a fight over the mic. He read it. And then I took him outside afterwards and was like, okay, this this was inappropriate. And, the, and here is why. And you are no longer in the group. And I'm removing you from the digital version of the book because you could not follow the guidelines everyone else followed right and in his mind i i should not have done that and what he did is he recorded our conversation he literally took his phone and he recorded our conversation and then he decided to play it for all the other authors of the anthology and like sent it to him it was bizarre and everybody else was like no she was clear that this was only for the print version they all kind of went this was inappropriate what you did, blah, blah, blah. But my failure in all of this was to not see it happening as it was happening and work better to manage the situation so that the two charities that needed to get the money got as much money as possible so that no one felt bad, blah, blah, blah. This person's actions were inappropriate. My job was to minimize the fallout. And I think I did pretty well. But I learned a lot about how to manage groups through that experience. So on the level of was there a weird thing that happened at this book release? Yes, a weird thing happened. And that was partially my failure because I was the host. I was the organizer and I was the host. So that was my failure for sure. But I learned so much about how to manage people and how to manage group shenanigans, if you will, group interaction, group dynamics, and group collaborations from that experience that I have then taken to, I do workshops at companies that help them sort of do team building through self-expression. So we will write, we will sing, we will create, we will do things so that the team coalesces as a team. And the lessons I learned from that bizarre experience where I did fail, I failed to do as well as I could have, I have now taken and, and infused into my workshops so that other people can benefit from my failure. The younger generation is looking at your amazing careers and are becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an author, a podcaster, maybe NASA, who knows, but as long as you've inspired them down a creative path, hopefully they find something that they're going to enjoy in their lifetime. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think by living truthfully, by being kind, and by being creative, by trying things. You know, the younger generation is a take no BS generation. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to cuss on this. So it's a take no BS generation. They are, they know what they want. They know they believe in kindness. They know they believe in pushing limits. They know they believe in wanting better. You know, look at Greta. Greta's a perfect example of someone who went, no, I will not accept this. I'm going to take a stand. And she did. Malala is another person, took a stand and she did. She changed in many ways. She changed the world. So they can do it by seeing what needs fixing and fixing it. And that will inspire the generation that comes after them in the same way. I'm going to give you an example I used to work for this environmental education program at NASA and uh, Saudi Arabia is one of the countries. It's a K through 12 international environmental program called the GLOBE program, which means global learning and observations to benefit the environment. That's the program I worked for. 
More than 100 countries participate. It's a K through 12 program where students, scientists, and teachers all partner up to study their local ecosystems so that they can monitor essentially the health of their local environment, but also share that data so that anyone in the world can do research with that data. Saudi Arabia is one of the partner countries. Now, what's interesting about Saudi Arabia, of course, is that it has, in many ways, uh, girls and boys, as far as students, are treated differently. During this program and through Saudi Arabia's participation in the program, for the first time, girls were allowed to go outside to do the science. Right? So by those of us who were trying to do the science to teach the environment, sort of environmental awareness and all of that, somebody there got inspired and the teachers and the people and the government worked together to enable the girls to go outside, which they had not been allowed to do before, to enable the girls to go outside to take the measurements themselves. Revolutionary, right? Revolutionary for that part of the world. I look at it, you look at it, you in Canada, me here in the USA, and we both go, of course, they should be allowed to go outside. Of course, that's there should not even be a question. But that's a different part of the world. It's a different culture. And having that door open is huge. That is the kind of inspiration we can take from the younger generation because they're doing it. They're pushing those boundaries. And they're going to inspire others to push, to push even more, to get to the place where we can all be proud of who we are. And again, I like I end you'll hear this when you're on my show. I end every single episode with the words be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. And every episode ends that way because those are the three tenets I want to live by. But I guess maybe be inspiring <laughs> is another one <laughs> because because inspiration and inspiring others to try for more, to try for better, to try to create, to try to be a better person and to also be a kinder person, it's about the best thing you can do. I mean, I think throughout this entire interview, I could have just let the camera on you and I could have just asked the questions from the side. You know, this would have been awesome. If your life was a comic movie or TV series, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, my stars. <laughs> I, I I am rubbish at, at naming things, like rubbish. So this is going to be interesting. Ah, uh, ha, ha, ha. Um... Take your time. Oh, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> la la la. Da 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 yeah, da yeah. da. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I played a wedding for friends once, and the bride was taking a really long time to get married, and huh? her uh, everybody we were all seated. Her grandfather, who's or hit her the groom's groom's grandfather, who's older was having trouble standing, everybody's waiting, and I was playing fiddle. And they were like, you're going to need to play like 15 minutes of fiddle tunes. Uh, it turned into an hour and a half. And so there I am ready to play the bride down the aisle with a little waltz type tune. She's not coming down. And then finally I started going, okay, I've gone through my entire repertoire. And I started playing the Jeopardy theme song. <laughs> and she still didn't come out. So I started playing the Darth Vader. Dum, dum, <laughs> dum, <laughs> dum, 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 dum. So I play, I, I like literally played everything. So <laughs> that was that was an interesting moment in my life. Um, and I don't even remember why I started talking about it. But um, I I just, I have, I'm, the title would be uh, Try Anything and Everything. Uh, that's what came to mind. And the soundtrack would be a combination of John Williams' original Star Wars the Raiders soundtrack, uh, and some kind of funky 80s groove, <laughs> as well as the inimitable Sarah Vaughn mm. singing sultry, sultry, sultry jazz, blues-tinged jazz. Well, Zola, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks <laughs> Talking. You survived, so thank you so much for being <laughs> on the show. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is great, Kurt. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, anything else, social media-wise or websites you'd like to promote, please insert them here. Ah, okay, great. Uh, thank you for that. So a couple of different places. If you want to know about my writing, is ZoldaTauthor.com. If you want to know about my uh, speaking and the workshops I do to help people get creative, uh, 
get creative with your bad self. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is uh, isoldaspeaks.com, although that's going to be changing soon. If you want to know about my coaching, it's outofsightinsight.com. And my socials are mostly at T. And also Creative Solutions Podcast. So, for example, Instagram, I have two accounts. One is at Isolda T and the other one is Creative Solutions Podcast. And the same with TikTok, at Isolda T and Creative Solutions Podcast. Uh, I don't, I'm not on Twitter or whatever it's called. Uh, I, Threads, at Isolda T, LinkedIn, at Isolda T, Facebook is the only one that's Isolda.Trachtenberg because somebody else grabbed at his old T and one, it's an interesting thing about my name. So it used to be, my name was uncommon everywhere, anywhere I went, even in the former Soviet union where I was born, I wasn't named. It's not a Russian name. It's actually Irish. And I was named after the opera Tristan and Isolde because my mother's a singer. And so nobody ever knew how to say my name or pronounce my name, blah, blah, blah. And when we moved to Israel, they were like, nah, that's too anti-Semitic. We're going to go with Israela because that was my great grandfather's name. And I was actually named after him. And then I became an adult and the opportunity became, uh, it became a possibility to have your own website, blah, blah, blah. You could buy your own domain name. And it turned out that someone else had gotten Isolde, some German company. And so I got Isolde T, which a lot of people say looks like Isoldat, which isn't great. Uh, and I'm trying to change it. But what's interesting about it, though, is that suddenly over the last 20, 30 years, the name has become more popular particularly with Eastern European porn stars. So for a while there, I was getting a lot of spam from the Isoldas out there whose nom, nom de guerre, if you will, is Isolda, spelled the way I spell it, I-Z-O-L-D-A. And so lots and lots of Eastern European porn stars. So be, getting anything with Isolda in it became problematic. And if you were not exactly right in typing what you needed to type, you would go places that you probably do not want to go, especially in relation to me. So there you go. That's why it's Isolda at Isolda T.com, Isolda T author. Uh, music is in there somewhere right now. I can't even think of the name of the of the site. But you if you want to find me, those are all the various places. You almost need a link tree to link absolutely everything <laughs> you've done here. Uh, and hopefully that is all the T name or whatever you'd like to put together for that is available. Or you're going to see a link tree of someone's porn stuff. So <laughs> for sure, we know we know you're the original. That's all that matters here. The OG, for exactly. sure. <laughs> Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview on our website, tgtmedia.com or Two Geeks Talking. That's T-W-O. Go to our YouTube channel. That's always updated. YouTube.com forward slash TGT Media. Podcast is back. Find it at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.